Glasswire is the ultimate firewall and network monitoring software. Check it out at the link below. What's up guys, CP Moddy here back with another video and today we're here with a brand new series kicking it off with the monthly motherboard spotlight. A series where we take a brief look at a motherboard every single month and see well what's actually going on with the board. I personally love motherboards but I uh, never seem to have enough time to do full in-depth reviews so I thought why not start putting some time aside each month to start to take a look at them and the more this series goes on obviously the more in-depth we'll get but seeing this is episode number one let's kick into it and today we're looking at the Gigabyte X99 UD4 motherboard. A mid to high end type of X299 motherboard that offers a lot of features but a very simple monochrome design. And kicking things off in the design department as we usually do with these videos, taking a look at it, we do have a dark kind of grey to black PCB accented with some pretty simple black, light grey and also two silver accents. RGB wise, we're looking at really none on this particular motherboard and in terms of LEDs at all, we do have the yellow audio divider that lights up, but really not much in the terms of LEDs themselves. However, with that being said, RGB is definitely supported with two RGB headers on this guy that can be controlled both within the software, but also too within application that you can install on your Android phone, or I believe even iOS, but I could be wrong on that one. But either way, when it comes to RGB, this motherboard does support it, it just doesn't have any built in. Now, personally, I really do like this as it keeps the board looking relatively clean and very neutral looking. So whatever build you do decide to do with this board, it's definitely going to look pretty neutral and clean in all the builds that you actually go ahead and use. Now, speaking of actually standing out, or not really standing at all, the audio is definitely a standout part. Not only does it stand out visually with these red little guys down here, but we are looking at audio components from Wimmer, and with a 120 dB Realtek ALC 1220 chipset, this guy is going to be very, very loud. So whatever headphones you plug in, it's really got you covered when it comes to onboard audio. Don't get me wrong, if you were to go ahead and plug in your own external amp and DAC and all that kind of stuff, sure you could get better quality audio, but for a built-in solution, it's definitely not doing too bad. And Gigabyte even claims that when you plug in headphones, it will dynamically adjust the, uh things in the background to make it work better and obviously give you a better experience. Now, I'm not sure whether that exactly worked, but when I plugged in my M50X headphones and a number of other more gaming oriented type of headphones, audio was clean and crisp across the board and audio also too was able to be loud enough for me to hear. In fact, I could take my Audio Technicas off and actually just play music through them and it was super loud. So yes, uh, the onboard audio is definitely no slouch. Now, rounding out the design, we are also too looking at 5 peaks IE 16X physical slots however only two of them are running in 4x mode so you do want to keep that in mind that there are two not actually running in full 16x modes and on top of this depending on what CPU will actually dictate what you can actually run in terms of PCI connectivity heck even RAM connectivity now because of Intel's new sort of weird SKUs you got everything from an i9 to a low-end i7 there is definitely quite a bit going on here when it comes to options but for the most part, if you were to install an i9, everything would be active, and if you go down then to the lowest, not everything will be active. So I'll leave you with this graph right here to sort of, I guess, explain what will be active and what won't be active. And as we can see here, depending on the CPU that you have, it will then depend on what PCI Express are active. There's also two 8 SATA ports with no built-in U.2 slots, so if you are one of those few people out there using a U.2 SSD, you will need to grab yourself a little adapter. And overall, there's a nice design on the chipset heatsink. Overall, in the aesthetics department, this board is definitely simple, but definitely also too looks pretty jam-packed. There's no fancy LEDs, but in terms of what's going on in terms of the motherboard, definitely looks pretty nice here. Yeah. Now jumping closer into that connectivity, we are looking at 8 RAM DIMM slots, again depending on your CPU, 4 may be active or all 8 may be active, coming down to what you do have right there. We also do get dual M.2 slots supporting 22.110 and also 22.80 mm sizes, so do keep in mind you can't have two 22.110. 10 uh, SSDs. You will have to have uh, one or the other, but we do have support for it anyway. We also do get support for Quad SLI and also do Quad uh, Crossfire, so if you for some reason have some older video cards you still want to run in 4 weight, that can be done. However, once again, I sound like a broken record, it will definitely depend on what CPU you do have, so do keep that in mind. Other things that we should also do take a look at in terms of connectivity, we're rocking dual USB 3.0 front headers, but there's unfortunately no USB Type-C header, which was definitely disappointing 
disappointment. Speaking of those disappointments, we'll touch on them more in just a moment. Networking wise, we are looking at the Intel LAN GBE controller, which is not too bad there. And for our USB 3.1 connectivity, we are looking at as media chipsets and also to Intel chipsets. And take a look at this graph right here. We don't see that much of a difference between the two different standards. It more comes down to the connection types on the end. Now, yes, that was a Windows file transfer, but to be clear, I was just using my USB flash drive, so uh, performance could be better if I was using something a little bit faster. But either way, whether we're using the Intel chipset or the AS Media, I personally didn't notice too much of a difference here. But getting into the actual building with this guy, as well, you'll be building with a motherboard. The overall quality didn't feel too bad, and everything seemed to just fit into place, which was really nice to see. There's definitely quite a few motherboards out there that are built with that have weird power connectors in weird locations and unfortunately this motherboard is also to one of them but we'll touch on that in just a moment. M.2 slots were just about where you would expect them and PCI Express connectivity was also to not too bad when it came to building. If you are interested in fan headers and don't have your own connections yourself you will find three along the top, one over near the left RAM bank and one over near the 24 pin. All up you do get quite a few uh, fan connectors which is not nice to see for most modern builds out there. Also too, while this is something that I could not really see, Gigabyte's also too included an insane six temperature sensors. So they're there on the motherboard as we can see in this graph from the Gigabyte website. You can't see them in person but it was really nice to see. And whether it will really make a difference on your next build I'm not exactly sure but overall it was one of those nice to haves in terms of a little feature right there. But overall the board itself felt really solid when you actually had it in your hand it didn't flex or bend or make any weird creaking noises, so overall it wasn't too bad. Oh, and also too, one more feature that I also do like was the ability to plug in a um, actual temp sensor. So rather than relying on the six that were actually on the motherboard, there's actually a header on there that you can plug in a standard little temp sensor and run that to wherever you want. This is something that I personally liked. Yes, it's more designed for the water cooling world, but hey, if you plug in a sensor right there, it's still gonna read the temperature there. Personally, something that I absolutely love, but may not be a deal breaker or a deal maker for some other people out there. But that wasn't exactly the whole story. Sure, it was nice to build with, but there was definitely some sort of drawbacks with this particular motherboard. First and foremost was the EPS power connection location, being more to the right of the motherboard than over on the left like we generally expect. Now, straight in the center is a little bit sort of better, but this guy is quite over to one side. Now, yes, looking at where the EPS usually goes, there's definitely some controllers and some chipsets here, but it was very odd that it was in this location up the top. Many Many cases out there do have a small cutout over on the left hand side of the motherboard tray for the EPS power connection but this guy's over on the other side. Now, one of two things will happen, either your case will support it and it'll be totally fine, or you may run into the situation where you just got your EPS power running across the top, which for me personally, on a motherboard this expensive, really wasn't the biggest uh, fan of that design choice. And keeping it with actual design choices there in terms of uh, connections, the 24 pin, like a lot of other motherboards lately, is also to featured quite high on the motherboard there. So if we take a look at, for example, an X99 motherboard, which is what I personally run, we see that the 24 pin is right here. However, on this particular motherboard, if we do it's like a side by side comparison, we see it's up here. It's a little bit high and short, may not be the world's biggest difference, but especially in some cases that may not be having as good cable management or just have specific drilled out locations for cable management, it may become a little bit of an issue where you're actually having to run the cables into plain sight. And if your build is consisting more of putting the money towards the CPU and the GPU, things like, well, the case may not have as much money spent on it, meaning you're gonna be into some limiting situations. So it would be nice to see the 24 pin lower and the EPS more towards the left hand side but again at the same time in terms of the 24 pin you've got the USB 3 connections there why we couldn't have just switched them around yes they are taking up quite a bit of space but again flipping them around in my mind shouldn't be too much of a difference and over on the EPS side we could have just put those chipsets somewhere else maybe but I'm not a motherboard engineer so I can't definitely say for sure but just as an end user building with this I found it super odd that the power was super high and super to the right hand side. Again, these are definitely not deal breakers, but something you do want to keep in mind. Now, speaking of things that you do want to keep in mind, on top of these downsides, we also do have the M.2 slots not featuring any kind of coolers or covers. So if you have a gross green PCB SSD, you will want to look into a cover. Or if you've got one of Samsung's badass new actual super fast SSDs, you'll probably also do want to look into getting an aftermarket cooler, which might be definitely a good investment. But if you are looking at this motherboard with Wi-Fi, 
It's also to another point that is actually missing. There's no M.2 slot that's conveniently placed uh, near where the I.O. would be, and also too, there is no I.O. knockouts for it either. But all in all, the X99 UD4 Gigabyte motherboard is actually a pretty simple board that still packs quite a punch at the price point it does come out. Sure, it does not have all the super high-end features and the power connectors maybe in a bit of a weird locations, and some of the downsides are kind of a weird situation, like no RGBs, something that may be a downside for others, but but connectivity is definitely on point whether you want to run multiple video cards, a bunch of hard drives or SSDs, or a really high-end system with a ton of RAM, it definitely has got you covered. For a solid board at an okay price point, it's definitely hard to fault the X99 UD4 from Gigabyte. And there we go, that is this month's motherboard spotlight. If you want to pick up one of these motherboards, you can find them linked down in that description box. And also do let me know in that comment section. When you are building a new system, do you like motherboards that are jam-packed full of RGB LEDs and have headers everywhere? LEDs everywhere, or, or you like a little bit more like me, where I prefer to have the header support, but don't necessarily want my motherboard covered in RGB LEDs. Let me know in that comment section. Thanks all for watching, and I will catch you all in the next one.